What a privilege to be here today with all of you. I'm here to talk about a new golden age. In fact, I think we're all here to talk about that. We're here because we know deep inside that our troubled world needs repair, and it's absolutely crucial, and it's possible. That's why we continue to get up in the morning to strive for a better world. For me, I know it's possible because of what I've learned in, from nature. So that's what I'm here to talk about, some of the lessons I've learned from nature. Nature. There's something good and restful and hopeful in that word. When I just mentioned that word, did it remind you of somewhere special, a forest, a beach, a garden? I have lots of places like that. When I was a child growing up in Australia, I spent any time I wasn't in school out in nature. A lot of times I should have been in school as well. It's always where I felt completely at home. One of the first things I noticed about nature was that everything is always moving. In fact, that's true from the quantum level to the cosmological. As Einstein said, in order for something to exist in a time-space continuum, it must be moving. Electrons vibrate, the Earth spins, it's all moving. Even solid rocks and landscapes are eroding, and solid steel is rusting. The universe is a seething, bubbling, boiling cauldron of movement. Now, it's easy to think of all of that movement as chaotic, and science generally sees it that way. But there's a common shape underlying all of that movement in the universe. This entire universe and everything in it is moving and following the same path as moving water. What is that path? As a kid swimming in the Indian Ocean, and as Nina just mentioned, I noticed that seaweed would break off in my hand if I tried to hold on to it while I was swimming. That same seaweed wouldn't break off even in a wild storm. And seaweed, all seaweed, changes its shape into a particular spiral to let the huge force of water go by. Its very survival depends on the shape it takes. The water is flowing in its path of least drag and resistance, the most streamlined path. And the seaweed is simply doing what nature insists. When I realized this, I was captivated, and I've been fascinated by it ever since. I started to see this shape all around me and look more and more closely at its examples. It opened up a whole universe of possibilities. Let me show you a few. The same shape I saw in seaweed, I saw in seashells and in hurricanes. This is the x-ray of a seashell and the picture of a tornado. What's really amazing is if you look at these spiraling shapes from the side, you see they've all got the same geometry. Here's water going down the drain and a seashell. This one is a human skin pore. Our pores are this shape. We perspire in this shape. It's nature's ultimate air conditioning system. Just seeing these pictures is inspiring. Nature's designs are stunningly elegant. I could show you thousands of examples of this shape, from weather patterns to the flow of blood in our veins, to the way we breathe, to the swirling flows of lava and glaciers. We've got here a uh, vortex, or a uh, whirlpool on the right, and on the left we have uh, a firestorm. In fact, it underlies everything from particle decay to galaxies. All things that flow or grow do so in this shape and only in this shape. Obviously, I'm not the first person to notice these spirals in nature. In fact, it's the most common archetypal symbol across all historical cultures going back 50,000 years. Look at this megalithic stone from Newgrange. And this one is a bishop's crook. The Maoris traditionally tattooed their body with this shape and continue to do so. Here's the prow of a Viking ship. And this is a famous Japanese painting of a wave. All the great civilizations, the Greeks, the Celts, India, Islam, Native America, 
Tibetans, Zulus, Australian Aboriginals, all recognize this shape, and it's in their folklore. In many cases, it was felt to be a representation of the divine. When I studied physics and astronomy and mathematics, I found that the great thinkers of recorded history were also fascinated by this shape. It was referred to as the golden spiral, or the golden proportion, and was regarded as having sacred or mystical properties. Plato called it the building block of the universe. Pythagoras even had a secret society built around the spirals he saw in nature. Leonardo da Vinci spent the last 10 years of his life absolutely obsessed by these spirals, and he painted whirlpools and flow. In fact, all of the great artists of the Renaissance used the maths underlying the spiral to base their art on. Descartes, the father of science, wrote a major treatise on the spiral. Bernoulli is the father of fluid dynamics, and he had the spiral in, inscribed on his gravestone. Einstein was the last of the great masters to be captivated by the spiral. All these minds were astonished and captivated by the spiral and the complex mass behind it. They saw it as a universal blueprint for beauty and functionality. But what about science and technology? Well, I found out when I was a boy how functional the shape was because I love building canoes and boats. And when I copied nature's curves in those shapes, I found that they were far stronger and and faster. The more I experimented, the more I realized that this golden spiraling shape is the path of least resistance, the most streamlined. I learned that in technology, nothing competes with nature's efficiency. But people didn't seem to realize this. In fact, the world of technology thinks that energy efficiency is derived from making things move in straight lines, not curved lines. So here's this incredibly efficient shape that nature uses exclusively, but science and technology doesn't use. Why not? Well, for one thing, the Industrial Revolution was all about mass production, making cookie cutter forms out of flat sheets and making square boxes. Natural design was literally squeezed out. And until the advance of computers, until very recently, you could not have mass produced these shapes even if you did think they were more efficient. The Industrial Revolution was also about cheap, plentiful power. If you wanted more speed, you didn't try to change the shape, you just added uh, more horsepower and blasted your way through, never mind global warming. Here's the rub. Unlike technology, nature never stamps out squared off boxes and nature never travels in straight lines. Here's what I realized. If everything is movement, and if all movement shares a common geometry, and if nature uses that shape exclusively, and technology doesn't use that shape, then by going back to that optimum shape, we can dramatically improve technology. And that can change the whole world. So once I put this together, what did I do? I decided to show industry that it's more profitable to copy nature than to destroy it. I started companies that design boats and pack scientific, that designs propellers and fans and mixers and pumps. And these devices are consistently better than conventional equipment. They're quieter, they're more energy efficient, and they're even nice to look at. There's an old saying amongst boat builders, if it looks good, it is good. We inherently recognize natural design because we humans are built to the same design ourselves. Even our bones and our muscles and our teeth and the cochlea of our ears are all built in accordance with the golden spiral. At PAX, we started with familiar products that are noisy and wasteful, like your kitchen and bathroom fans. Millions are sold every year, and you know many of them are less than 6% energy efficient. That means that 94% of the energy you're putting into your kitchen and bathroom fans is wasted. We retrofitted our fans into these products to reduce noise and to increase efficiency. We're working with Paul Hawken to license our design to manufacturers. 
and you'll be able to buy them across America very soon. We're working on water treatment too. Here's our lily impeller. <laughs> and the x-ray of the flower that inspired its name. Using this impeller, we're able to improve the drinking water in cities without using chemicals. We use a tiny amount of power, less than you use in a small light bulb, to rotate one of these six inches long in a million gallons of water. In less than 24 hours, we can completely mix that water and save 85% of the energy that communities are currently spending on that type of activity. The applications are endless. These are just a couple. Here's one of our latest impeller shapes. It looks like seaweed flowing in the current, and that's exactly where we started from. A team of fluid dynamicists at Stanford University recently studied our designs and proved that these shapes in technology are indeed unique. They create smoother, more streamlined flow paths. It was a shock for them. It defied common wisdom. So these are some of the tools that we've found, the tools that my fabulous team is using to design the next golden age. Fully implemented globally, and we're aiming for 15 years, we can put a huge dent in the world's energy bill and produce far less. and produce far less emissions and waste. All over the world, hundreds, thousands of people are finding their own tools. By copying nature, they're becoming what Janine Benyus calls biomimics, which uh, Nina just mentioned. She coined that term to describe technology that was inspired by nature. And if you find all this interesting, please buy her book. It's called Biomimicry. Now, I want to close by telling you about one more really important lesson I learned from nature. Do you remember when you were children, the soaring optimism we had, how everything was possible, everything was exciting, we looked forward to everything. And then we grow up, and sometimes this mess we're in can look pretty overwhelming, scary, hopeless like we're racing the clock, or maybe we're even too late. I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of us here feel that sometimes. With nature, it's never too late. Nature is always optimistic. Nature never gives up. Nature heals all wounds. Nature pushes up tiny little blades of grass through concrete and asphalt, and she grows jungles over Mayan cities. She keeps putting out billions of seeds and spores and baby spiders. She grows mountains and she evolves new species. She's always creating. Nature develops DDT-resistant bugs and others that eat oil and gasoline spills. She's even creating bugs that get around genetically modified crops in less than six years. It's not just okay to feel optimistic, it's essential. Combining our human intelligence with optimism is the best way we can give back to the Earth. Right now, in this room and around the globe, we humans, the products of nature, have the resources and the technology to solve just about any problem if we have the will. There is a way if we allow ourselves to be inspired by nature's optimism and nature's wisdom. We can do it. We are doing it, and we will do it. Enjoy these days. <laughs> Enjoy these days. This is a very special opportunity every year. Be optimistic, and thank you for listening.